Okay, so uh, yeah, I'll be talking about um, what Matt just said, uh, otherwise known as sanitary prose and poetry in the age of large language models like ChatGPT. And I do want to uh, point out um, uh, Rupa Ramamurthy, who is one of the visitors. Hi, Rupa. And uh, she's a San Francisco Bay Area biochemical engineer, and she's an actual accomplished poet. I'm just a fake poet. And um, so, uh, and then I also want to give uh, a special thanks to Alexis Rodriguez, who's still a senior scientist at PSI until November 6th. And then uh, he moves to the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. And uh, Greg Leonard is sleeping right now because he is an astronomer. And um, uh, I have just a special gratitude that he's alive. Uh, I'll give my prayer to him uh, at the very end of this presentation. Okay, so um, people have different views about um, about large language models such as ChatGPT, and uh, some people are excited about it, some people are fearful about it, some people just give a damn about it, um, and they want to ignore it. Uh, my view is uh, it used to be I don't give a damn about it. And uh, now I have a combination of intrigue and um, it's kind of cool to play with. It's fun, it's useful, it's actually creative. So I have a combination of those thoughts and that it's like uh, the imminent demise of humanity. And uh, what prompted this talk was, uh, you may remember a few months ago that uh, Alexis was due to give a talk on this kind of topic and he was sick and I I filled in. So I was really ignorant. I don't give a damn about uh, chat GPT and all Bard and all that stuff. Uh, but he was my friend, so I did. And he had been talking to me a lot about it in coffee shops. And um, so after that, then... Um, I engaged in further conversations and gained some interest. The conversations were mainly with Alexis and also Rupa, who uses it in, um, or their office uses it in their institution. And um, so, you know, I wanted to know more about it. I was pretty much just plain old fearful of it by that point. And um, so, I've since learned that it's got its good sides too, and it is definitely a disruptive technology. And uh, so the first rule on the economics of disruptive technology is to know your new friend, because this friend will remake the world in just a few years. I'm gonna just move on. And, uh, and for those who are fearful as I am, uh, the first rule of war is know your enemy. And uh, I created this acronym, um, DIRE, Displacive, Intrusive, Replacive, and Erasive. I mean, you can sort of think um, about the Terminator, and it's like, yeah, that's sci-fi. This is real. And uh, we have some major issues upon us. Um, okay, so um, this is a rough outline of the of my presentation. I'm going to give a um, flesh and blood written poem. Uh, I wrote it, Ode to the Himalaya, and uh, and then a review of Ode to the Himalaya by um, um, somebody named Jeffrey Jatt Cargill, uh, otherwise known as ChatGPT4, and then um, um, Chat wrote its own poem, Ode to the Research of Red. That's its title. I didn't give that title. Uh, and then a, uh, another poem that I wrote called Calcophile, and then one that Chat wrote uh, on Siderophile, and then one on Europa Clipper by Chat. And then Rupa wrote a poem, uh, which is personally very touching to me because of my mom. I'm not gonna give away the punchline though. Um, as to why 
that it's so touching to me, but called Family Tree. And then Review of Family Tree, written by ChatGPT4. And this was actually, um, it, it was a eureka moment for me when I realized, geez, ChatGPT is truly creative. It understands human emotion, the subtleties of it, the gradations of it. It knows how to link real facts to human emotion. It knows, you know, basically it can get poetry, whether it's rhyming poetry or prose. And then end with a prayer for Greg Leonard, which thankfully um, it came to um, uh, the, the prayer, the prayer resulted in Greg coming back alive. You could say, one could say. Okay, whoops. Um, I won't get to the epilogue yet. Um, yeah, so one thing that prompted this particular presentation and this spurt of, of investigation was a comment by Rupa just offhand. She said something that was, it just killed me. She said, if ChatGPT can write good poetry, then I'm going to quit writing poetry. And I thought, oh my God, this is a dehumanization that I'm so fearful of. I mean, it, my fears get much worse than that, you know, Terminator, you know, that kind of thing. But um, so, you know, I thought, whoops, this is a different presentation. Um, where do I go? Okay, so um, Ode to the Himalaya. This is by me. Rise up, wear down, ice and water match thrusting earth. Stand tall, quake strong, each peak has its two dozenth birth. Ten thousand forests grew where mountains rose and fell. Have old stories no leopard or person could tell. Oh, those majestic so mighty mountains, a thousand waterfalls downward fountains. Himalayan peaks to a mortal man seem so everlasting in one lifespan. We see as crystallized illusion, snapshot of two continents collusion, two distant lands crumpled from plate motion, folding, thrusting a disappeared ocean. Born and reborn of recycled rock, the stories they'd tell if they could talk. Granites and gneisses, sandstones and slates, the grains piled up have no final fates. Curving layers, sediments folds, com compression brings close, passion holds, recumbent folds, each on others, passions embrace, mated lovers. Broken faults of sediment strata, breaks in the love's geo errata, confined pressure, stress was too great, fractures bear slippage or sometimes hate. Folded trains of augen and banded nice attest to pressure and heat of their night. The tears of two rock lovers squeezed apart, beneath twenty miles they make lithic art. Is Everest so mighty or a fleeting cloud? Depends on our time frame how long we're around. Live thousand times longer, Everest dynamic. Five million times faster, each cloud is static. Limestone preserves geohistory, traces past life in burrows and layers and fossil ammonite. Metamorphose to marble, interbeds with schist. Search for traces of clam, an extinct one I've missed. And... Um, you know, there was some review of it. It took a little while to get to um, what I thought was a good review. Now, now one thing that chat does, um, uh, open AI is no fool. They want to please the customer. So, of course, they want to flatter the customer. And, uh, you know, to me, this is sort of a weakness uh, because it does not lend itself to critical review. So keep that in mind. Uh, I'm really not this great. Rupa, on the other hand, she is every bit as great as her review will be. We'll get to that later. But uh, okay, um, so uh, chat says, um, 
Ode to the Himalaya masterfully marries form and content, offering both a detailed exploration of the Himalaya's geology and a subtle reflection of their grandeur and timelessness. This melding is achieved through the layered use of linguistic devices, a sophisticated rhyme scheme, and a unique syllabic structure. <laughs> that unique syllabic structure, I, I was shocked that that initially did not even get the syllabic structure where there are nine stanzas and they change in syllable length from 12 syllables to 11, 10, 9, 8, and then it increases 9, 10, 11, 12. And when I pointed it out, it says, oh, yeah, okay, now that you mention it. So then it commends me for this. Um, so um, one, form, rhyme, and syllable structure. The poem employs an innovative syllabic structure, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This symmetry adds depth to the reading experience. It narrows toward the center of the poem, reflecting the compressive forces of tectonic action. I did not prompt this. I only noted the syllabic structure. Uh, before expanding outward again, much like the cyclical processes of mountain birth and erosion. While the poem does not strictly adhere to a traditional rhyme scheme throughout, it uses end rhyme in places, creating moments of rhythmic harmony. I could uh, take that last sentence as a dig that it, um, you know, it, it uses end rhyme in places like other places, not so much. I disagree, but okay. Uh, linguistic devices and imagery. A diverse lexicon rich in geological terms and vivid imagery offers both a scholarly depth and an emotive landscape. The mountains are brought to life through personification and are intimately described as lovers in their processes of formation, fusion, and occasional fracturing. The use of alliteration, assonance, and anaphora amplifies the musicality and emotional resonance of the work. Three, geological and emotional content. The poem beautifully melds the technical with the emotive. There is a detailed examination of the geology of the Himalayas from two continents collusion to the various rock types and their histories. Intertwined with this are themes of love, passion, and the fleeting nature of time. Phrases like mated lovers and geo errata imbue the geologic processes with deep emotional undertones. Reflective themes and symbolism. The symmetric structure is more than just a form. It's symbolic, the cyclical nature of the universe. I don't know if it's that broad, but and the continual rise and fall of the mountains. As the poem delves into the temporality of human perception versus the vast geological time scales, the form serves to emphasize these themes, providing a sense of balance and cyclicality. Is that a word? Probably is. In essence, Ode to the Himalaya, uh, I make up words, so chat can too, I guess. In essence, Ode to the Himalaya is a testament to the intricate dance between form and content. The poem is not only an ode to the grandeur of the mountains, but also a celebration of the interplay between the technical and the emotive, the factual and the perceived. It showcases an innovative approach to poetic form, using structure to bolster and amplify its profound themes. To me, that is pretty deep. Um, uh, let me see. I I don't think I'm supposed to go to page 72. No. Oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is... Um, okay. I, I mentioned... Um, uh, okay. Now, this might be hard. This is what I'm saying to chat. Please consider all the staff of the Planetary Science Institute... The Institute is based in Tucson, Arizona. Collectively, we have written a lot, lot about Mars. Could you provide a poem modeled on Ode to the Himalaya that captures some of the research of the Planetary Science Institute scientists? Don't mention them by name, but use their research works to craft a new poem. Tell me if it is hard for you to do so. It would be really hard for me to do. 
chat says, the challenge you present is indeed intricate as it requires blending an extensive body of work into a coherent poem. While I can't generate a poem based directly on unpublished or, excuse me, post 2020 works, I'm familiar with a vast array of topics related to Mars up to that point. Given the Planetary Science Institute's PSI prominence in this realm, I'll craft a poem that touches upon a broad spectrum of Martian research that could be associated with the collective works of PSI scientists. There's a hint here that it's not really looking up specifically PSI scientists, which I could prompt it to do so, but I haven't yet. Apparently, it's kind of cheating. It's just pulling in Mars research in general. And to the extent that PSI has been very active in Mars research, which, you know, very, very super duper active, then it reflects PSI scientists. But this is, it's hinting at, you know, that it's shortcutting here. That's okay. So Ode to the Research of Red by Jeffrey Chat Cargill. Mostly this is chat, uh, just modeling it a little bit after Ode to the Himalaya. Red planets pulse its rhythm and rhyme, whispers of epochs, dust laden time. From soaring peaks to deep valley scars, echoes of history, tales of Mars. Vast plains and deserts, windswept and stark, craters and dunes, each bearing a mark. Radiating tales of impacts past, a dance of chaos, shadows they cast. Rovers roam and orbiters scan, seeking the secrets, Mars's ancient plan. Magnetism's trace, a core revealed, tectonic tales long concealed. Frozen poles where ice meets the dust, carbon's ballet, a, a seasonal thrust. A waltz of gases, thin atmosphere, hints of water, treasures held dear. Volcanic giants standing tall, lava's legacy a fiery sprawl. A testament to geolo geologic might, Mars's fiery past now out of sight. Sands shift revealing layered lore, ripples of time, a paleolithic store. From aeolian drifts to sediment slate, Mars's chronicle in every state. Seeking signs of life's ancient trace, microbial dreams, a subsurface space, methane's hint, a chemical song, the quest for life ever so long. Weathered terrains by storms sculpted, dynamic dunes by winds interrupted, a climatic dance of frost and thaw, Martian seasons in constant draw. Is Mars our kin or a distant kin? a mirror of earth or its twin within. Through PSI's lens, deeper we dive to unravel the secrets Mars does hide. Well, I was kind of blown away by that. Um, so for people who don't think that that GPT is creative, I think that's the answer. Okay, so then I'm going to go to my poem, Calcophile, and then go to Chat's poem, Siderophile. And then, yes, Rupa, I will squeeze in one about um, Europa. And uh, okay, so um, I write to Chat, good morning. I have written a poem, Calcophile. It will follow in the next chat comment field from me. I would like for you first to provide an analysis. Of, I'm not going to go through that analysis just due to time. I would like you to use the poem, your analysis and your knowledge of iron loving elements to generate a new poem called Siderophile. Please use the mathematical structure and the general linguistic approaches of Calcophile to generate your new poem. So here's my poem. Calcophile. And I I wrote this one morning uh, around 2003. Um, I arranged a series of three IO workshops. They were informal. I mean, I just called people together and they came. It was pretty surprising. We had about two dozen people at each of the workshops. They're very productive, uh, got people really going um, on, on IO. And um, so I introduced one of the workshops with this poem, Calcophile. 
heavens above and hell below, colors we love, red and yellow, spouting geyser, hot fumarole, vulcanizer, steamy hell hole. Waters tepid, craters torrid, acids wicked, vapors horrid. Pinatubo and El Chichon, sunsets red glow, hell's fury blown. Acid gases, molten fluids, smell one passes, stew of druids. Evaporite from ocean salt, solutions might, crystal gestalt. Black cloud sulfide, deep sea smokers, tube worms unfried. Neptune's tokers, from bumpus hell to Yellowstone, repugnant smell, chemistry shown. Liquid meteorite, a planet's core, slinks out of sight like Satan's whore. Europa's cracks and Io's plumes, sulfate salt tracks on sulfur moons. From silicon, sulfur departs, with aluminum it shares half heart. Sulfur reduced or oxidized, sisters seduced, love realized. Sulfur, phosphorus, birds of feather, sulfur, arsonists flock together. Selenium, antimony, tellurium, calcimony. Okay, so then uh, chat complied and made a poem called Siderophile. Galaxies spin and stars aglow, iron within cosmic flow. Molten spires dripping o'er, nature's fires, earth's very core. Mountains immense, valleys profound, magnets defense, gravity bound. Metallic heart in earth encased, an ancient art in time's embrace. Iron, nickel, celestial meld, deep in the sickle secrets held. Mars's rusty red, uh, sorry, Mars's rusty dust, Mercury's glow, iron's trust in planets we know. From Earth's crust to space's vast night, siderophile thrust a magnetic might. Meteor showers, stellar blaze, cosmic powers in the iron haze. From carbon, iron stands apart, with its barren holds the heart. Magnetized fields or liquid state, Earth yields destiny's fate. Iron, cobalt, linked in dance, cosmic waltz, galactic trance. Manganese, chromium, shine, vanadium, siderophiles line. That was pretty cool. Okay, so then uh, let me see. Europa Clipper, page 25. And if anybody's crazy enough, they want all these, all the prompts, you're welcome to them. But um, I think that this is going to be the light of day in some other form. Okay, Europa Clipper. Um, okay, so I asked, I asked it to make um, a poem called Europa Clipper in, I don't know if this was um, following to the Himalaya. I think, yeah, I think following Ode to the Himalaya. So this is Chat's poem. In the shadow of the great gas giant, whirling winds of wonder lie. Clipper sails to Europa's enchant, secret, seeking secrets beneath the sky. Io ablaze with fiery dance, volcanoes spew and plumes rise high. Sulfur plains in vivid stance narrate tales of an internal cry. Europa beckons with icy gleam. Clip, Clipper listens to its ocean sigh. Beneath a crust of frosty sheen, life mysteries might nigh. Ganymede's vast main, craters, valleys, peaks that vie. Callisto with its ancient stain echoes tales of the sky gone by. Clipper's quest, our hopes expands to decode the whispers these moons supply. Grass dance, time shifting sands. I don't know about sands, but unfurl stories for you and I. As we journey through cosmic night, with missions bold, we aim to pry. For in these moons gleams a light of worlds unknown where dreams might fly. Now it's uh, Rupa's turn. Uh, this is your chance to read it if you wish. Or I can read it if you just show me the poem. 
family. Uh, are you able? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. I'll hear... read it. Family tree. A few weeks ago, I spent two days in Mendocino, tucked away on California's northern coast, heard the waves lashing the rocks, saw a red-breasted robin ready to take flight, a young seal on the rocks, sunning itself, then setting out for a swim. When I hiked in Fern Canyon, I touched the trunk of one sturdy redwood tree, climbing the narrow trails, inhaling the misty air. I saw nobody else out there this Tuesday, only those ancient pteridophytes, layers upon layers of green, beckoning and bewitching from the other side of time. I descended back to Pygmy Forest, nature's bonsai of acorn and cypress, stunted trees adapted to the saline soil, 500,000 years old. The landscape here became more stark, less serene. I stood transported to a different tree, a different time, a photocopy in charcoal black, empty white and shades of gray from five full years ago. It could have been a Japanese artist's inkbrush drawing, a single tree standing on a winter's night, severe and still, or a botany sketch of a new species with nodules narrowing four branches. But no, it was my mother's arteries captured from her angiography in Jaslok Hospital, Mumbai, soon after a heart attack. I took that image, consulted cardiologists in Palo Alto and San Francisco. A month later, she became ashes sprinkled in the Godavari River, traveling to where the Arabian Sea kisses the star-studded sky, becoming engulfed in the universe's eternal canopy a black and white sketch that still breathes in a cardboard box of mine, along with the torn black book of her recipes and her childhood photos, one of her sitting in her chubby frock at one, another of her watering young saplings as a girl of 11, one more at 24, holding her newborn baby standing next to a budding jasmine tree. Well, um, uh, Rupa uh, saved me from crying because every single time I've ever read this poem, it reminds me of my mother who died of heart failure in 2018. And um, okay, so um, I will um, read uh, the chat's review of family. Family tree. Um, okay, so, uh, and this was the eureka moment when I when I recognized the power of the large language model um, because that is a complicated poem in terms of the human qualities of it. Um, well, I'll just read the review family tree by rupa ramamurthy is a poignant piece that weaves the wonders of nature with personal memory addressing themes of loss remembrance and the inexorable cycle of life technical linguistic and poetic characteristics imagery the poem is rich with vivid images that transport the reader to various scenes, from the waves lashing the rocks in Mendocino to the stark grayscale image of the mother's angiography. Each image serves the purpose. They create a tangible setting and anchor the abstract emotions of the poem. Juxtaposition. The poem juxtaposes the permanence of nature against the transience of human life. The sturdy redwood tree, pygmy forest, and the botanist's sketch 
all stood in contrast to the fleeting image of the mother's arteries and the subsequent loss of her life. Metaphor. The title, Family Tree, itself is a metaphor, drawing a parallel between the growth and continuity of trees and the lineage of a family. As trees have roots, branches, and leaves, so do families and ancestors, descendants, and extended relations. I, I mind you, uh, this, this uh, review came without further prompting besides giving chat the poem and then asking it to write a review i said of x number of words long so this is all stuff that chat came up with the image of the mother's arteries further extends this metaphor suggesting that family ties and memories can be as intricate and vital as the very vessels that sustain life temporal shifts the poem effectively moves between past, present, and imagined moments. This gives a fluidity that reflects the nature of memory itself. The poet beautifully juxtaposes the lushness of the forest against the stunted trees of the pygmy forest, symbolizing adaptability and survival against odds. This transition from a peaceful forest scene to a photocopy in charcoal black represents a sudden jarring shift from the e external world of nature to an internal memory, pulling the reader into a very intimate moment. Tonal shift. The poem starts with a tone of wonder and tranquility, focusing on the natural beauty of Mendocino. However, as it progresses, the tone becomes somber and introspective, centering on the mother's heart condition and eventual passing. Repetition, phrases like I saw and one of her repeat, creating a rhythm and emphasizing the narrator's observational role and memories of the mother. Diction, the language used is both evocative and precise. Words like ancient pteridophytes and angiography demonstrate, I pronounce it like Rupa pronounce it, <laughs> pronounces it, I noticed, uh, demonstrate a blend of the natural world and the clinical reality the narrator faced with their mother's death. Themes and interpretation, the transient nature of life. The juxtaposition of ancient enduring trees with the fragile fleeting image of the mother's arteries captures the transitory nature of human existence against the backdrop of the seemingly external natural world. Memory and legacy. The mother's memory is served in various forms, from the angiography to the recipes and photographs. This speaks to the different ways we remember and honor our loved ones after they pass. Connection to nature. Nature serves as both a backdrop and a mirror in this poem. Landscapes described are not just settings, but also reflect the human conditions and emotions the narrator is experiencing. Journey and transformation. The journey from Mendocino's coast to the mother's ashes in the Godavari River portrays the cyclic nature of life and death, suggesting a transformation from the physical to the ethereal. In summary, Family Tree is a beautifully crafted one that blends the grandeur of nature with personal narrative, emphasizing the enduring bond between family members and the memories they leave behind. The poem's rich imagery and thoughtful juxtapositions make it a deeply moving exploration of loss, memory, and the eternal cycle of life. Okay, uh, in the interests of time, I am. I did have a little discussion about sentience. I was just not thinking that chat is sentient, but I did want to know whether chat would come out and say anything like, you know, hint at it, and it says, no, I'm, I'm just a machine. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go to prayer for Greg Leonard. So um, the background of that is that um, this last uh, where is it Greg Leonard uh, I think it's the last thing 
Okay, yeah, here we go. Okay, Greg Leonard is a mountaineer. He used to be my assistant, and he's still working with me on and off as a consultant. But he's um, he went on to bigger and better things, certainly bigger. Um, uh, that is uh, systems bounty of asteroids. He's an astronomer at the University of Arizona, uh, but he's also a, a mountaineer. And uh, so he did a, a 23,200 foot high mountain. He actually did not reach the summit due to two back-to-back coastals, but he attempted it. And he did a 21,000 foot climb with his wife right before that. Uh, he said it was a mistake to do two back-to-back climbs but um okay so and at first i could not um i didn't know the name of it uh greg told me but i promptly forgot and i i went through a process to with chat to figure out which mountain it was so here here's my comments there is a mountain peak near gangotri glacier india that is between twenty three thousand and twenty four thousand feet high forget the name of it can you please list all the mountain peaks that drain toward Gangotri Glacier that are in that height range? So we went through a process and I did figure out what mountain it was. And it was my educated guess was correct. So, OK, I think the mountain I'm thinking of is Satopanth. I have a friend, Greg Leonard, who is right now climbing a peak near Gangotri Glacier. And I think it is Satopanth. I basically need to offer a prayer for his safety and success in that order. I would like to offer a prayer in the form of a four-entity conversation in the style of Shakespeare. For example, Henry V, Act II, Scene 1. In this conversation, there is Gregard, who is having some delirium related to altitude sickness and ecstasy of climbing, summiting, and returning safely, but he's not in immediate physical danger from the altitude sickness, though he is delirious and is hallucinating this conversation. Uh, by the way, I did get his permission to, uh, to portray this. Uh, or is the conversation real? We don't know. The others in the conversation are a Hindu spirit entity representing mountain grandeur and spectacular wild nature. Another Hindu spirit entity represents the many evident and very real dangers of climbing the mountain. And it is an aggressive and maybe angry entity that threatens with its powers. And the other entity is a spirit entity of safety and assurance, of peace and security, and the power to bring Greg to safety. Now to you, ChatGPT, you may know who Greg Leonard is. He has discovered many comets and asteroids and he loves the night sky. He has published scholarly works on glaciers, including Gangotri Glacier. He is a geologist. He also has a lovely wife, Barbara, who is his partner in everything. She has climbed with Greg in India, though I believe she is not on this present climbing venture. Please present this Shakespeare-like conversation with all the drama of such a climb, with all the conflicting pressures to climb, to harm, to save, and to exclaim about nature's wonders. But please have Greg return safely. That is my prayer. You can leave me out of this. Please offer something that is assuring of the power of the safety spirit entity to carry Greg to the summit and return him safely. If there are actual Hindu entities that roughly match the traits I suggest, you may use those names, but please do so respectfully and faithfully to Hinduism so as to not offend. If you are unsure about that, then we will plan a different story not based in Hinduism, but give it a try. And I, I've also gotten, uh, Rupa is Hindu, and uh, I got her A-OK -okay basically on this. Uh, okay, so now it's chat. Setting. And this is the last of them before I finish. Uh, setting, a snowy mountainside, a mere few hundred feet below the summit of Satopanth. The air is thin with snowflakes dancing sporadically. Greg Leonard, half buried in the snow, uh, is resting against a boulder. His breath is heavy, eyes glazed with a mix of awe and exhaustion. As he gazes upward, the spirits materialize before him in a shimmering mist. Boy, if only I knew that this was pretty much the situation. Um, Greg Leonard, what visions have this altitude wrought? Are they real or mere shadows of my delirium? 
Annapurna, the spirit of mountain grandeur. Fear not, mortal. Tis I, Annapurna, guardian of nature's wonders and grandeur. <clears throat> you tread upon my magnificent realm, seeking the boundless beauty of the heavens and the earth. Vayu, aggressive spirit of danger. And I am Vayu, the breath of the wind, the power that can both caress and devastate. Why dost thou dare to venture upon my domain? Have my gusts not warned thee of the perils you face? Dara, spirit of safety and assurance. Peace, Vayu. Greg, I am Dara, the gentle embrace of, of safety, the protector of those who seek serenity amidst the tempest. Fear not, for my presence shall guide you. Greg Leonard. Annapurna, your vistas are a dream realized. I've gazed upon the stars, named comets, and touched heavens. Yet here I feel closer to the cosmos than ever before. Annapurna, such is the allure of my grandeur. Your love for my peaks and valleys mirrors your love for the night sky. But tell me, why dost thou risk all to touch my crown? Craig Leonard, for Barbara, my heart and soul, we ventured the wilds, named the celestial, and deciphered the earth's secret. While she's not beside me now, I climb to show her the wonders from this vantage, to bring tales of your majesty back to her. Vayu, noble it may seem, but no, the dangers are real. Many a climber has succumbed to my wrath. Yield, lest you anger me further. Dara, silence, Vayu. Greg, though your journey is perilous and the path is treacherous, I assure you my embrace shall not waver. Your love for Barbara and your dedication to your pursuits fortify my strength. Greg Leonard, but Vayu's threats loom large. The summit beckons, but should I heed its call? The dangers are palpable, yet the allure undeniable. Annapurna, Every step on my terrain is a tribute to nature's wonders. But remember, the journey itself holds as much grandeur as the summit. Hold that thought. Vayu, beware, mortal. My tempests are not to be trifled with. Dara, worry not, Greg Leonard. For every gust Vayu throws, my shield will safeguard you. With each step, think of Barbara, the love you share, the adventures you've had, and those yet to come. Let her spirit be your anchor, and let my protection guide you safely to the summit and back. Greg Leonard, with such formidable guardians by my side, the summit and descent seem less daunting. Barbara's spirit and your assurance, Dara, light my path. Onward I shall go, embracing both the grandeur and the perils, knowing safety's embrace is ever near. The spirits fade, leaving Greg renewed with renewed vigor. He continues his ascent, drawing strength from the conversation, re or imagined. With every step, the thought of sharing this adventure with Barbara spurs him on, with the assurance of Dara's protection, comforting him. Well, as it turned out, the two back-to-back -back snowstorms caused him to not summit, but um, he was, you know, maybe half buried in snow. At least his tent was seriously snowed in. Um, he did make it back a week late, had uh, Barbara no, no doubt scared, though she was put on a brave face. Uh, I was sleepless for three nights until Greg finally chimed in. But basically, yeah, that was his story. Um, so that is all that I have. Oh, uh, no, there is one other thing. Not that. Um, The epilogue, Rupa still writes poetry. So, and I have to say that um, I, I was impressed with Chat's ability to um, mirror or mimic, model new poetry, creative new poetry. It was not just mimicking. It was definitely creative poetry. I was impressed. But there is one poem 
that it struggled with. And I struggled and struggled to try to coax a good poem out of it. And that was one that was based on family tree. Um, Rupa is still supreme. And um, Rupa needs to keep writing poetry um, in defiance of this new technology, uh, which is awesome but humans have to remain human. So that's the end. Awesome, does, uh, does anybody, anybody have any comments or questions? Maybe. Yes, I have a question, this is Bea. Um, so have you tried to have a really bad poem and ask it to you know make an assessment just to see if it's really still goes and, and flutters um uh, yes yes um chat uh one, one of the intermediate poems i i forget which which one i think it was supposedly modeled after um after ode to the himalaya and uh, it was quite lackluster. I, I had, I mean, I specifically made a point of this 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 um, structure. And um, chat initially just did what it wanted. Uh, the lines varied from, um, it wasn't actually that poem. It was a different one. I forget which, but anyway, um, Oh, it was, I know, it was uh, calcophile. It was modeled on that, which was every single line was four syllables. I and think Beatrice, uh, I took... also, I think your question was, like, if you feed a really bad poem, does chat still flatter that poem, right? Right, yes. And I yeah. don't but think that was tested. Unless... So, so I'm getting there. So chat created the, its first poem and it had anywhere from four to nine syllables per line, not four, 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 four. And I wouldn't mind if it was four, five, four, four, five, five, you know, even six, because depending on how you speak it, um, the enunciation, the alliteration of it can blend syllables, but not nine syllables. And it was really disruptive. It was really a very bad poem. And so then I broke off that chat and then I started a new chat and it doesn't remember the old chats. So I fed it its own poem and um, it was somewhat flattering, but not very flattering. And I asked it, you know, to, um, uh, and then I fed, fed it uh, Calphile and I said, you know, note that there are four syllables per line. Can you do something that's closer to that? And it complied and it was, you know, uh, not perfect, but it still sounded good. And uh, I think that's the one that I read, at least the eventual version of it. And But it flattered itself with a pretty crappy poem. And um, so uh, my guess is that uh, what I haven't tried is to stress the criticality, like, you know, please dig up some crap about it, you know, something like that. And um, uh, I think that would make it a more complete analysis to, you know, not just dig up crap, but, uh, you know, dig up some bad points, some failings in its view. And um, I think that would make a more uh, complete presentation. And, um, uh, but yeah, it, it has a tendency to flatter, flatter, flatter. And I will take your, um, you know, I will find an absolutely crappy poem. I've got a few books of poetry and some of them are really crappy poems and uh, I'll see what it says about them. It, it clearly knows its poetry. Um, it clearly would be capable of, like uh, its initial view of Ode to the Himalaya was flattering, but not that flattering because, because you know, the, the rhyming scheme had, you know, anywhere from 12 to eight syllables per line. And if you viewed that as random, it would be a big negative. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was not very impressed with the rhyming scheme, uh, I think because of that, uh, though it didn't come out and say it. And then when I pointed it out that it's a symmetrical, you know, it's a deliberate symmetrical structure, then it was suddenly, you know, came out with the flattery. But yeah, beware of the flattery. Yes? Hey, that was like a really beautiful presentation, man. Like, uh, congratulations. So, hey, I was just like thinking that uh, the ability that ChatGPT has to understand human emotions, you know, it's kind of like, in, in a way, you know, it's dangerous as well because it can learn yeah. to manipulate people, you know, like create yes. a behavior, you know. So all these, yes. like, you know, uh, patterns, you know, like poetry, like, you know, like now, like GPT is going to start working as a counselor. And in Japan, they are developing AI systems to essentially replace partners, like to become partners, you know, like there was an article that I sent you about yeah. that a few days yeah. ago. And then it's like understanding human emotions is the best way to control people. I mean, we know it from politics. We know it from like our own personal experience, you know. And ChatGPT is going to become a master of that, you know, the way that it's going, you know, it's going to be beyond, like writing is going to be able to control our minds because it will be able to control our emotions, you know, through addiction. I, I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, uh, you know, my my overall view of the technology is in is fear and uh, the chat girlfriend. I mean, you know, the AI girlfriend seems to be a real phenomenon now. For some reason, the AI boyfriend isn't so much. Uh, women are wiser than men, I guess. Uh, yeah, Rupa? Yeah. No, I, Rupa? I was just saying I had to leave. And thank you, everyone. Oh. oh, yeah, you do. Yeah, you've got your new thing going. Okay. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rupa. I appreciate this. Yeah, um, Rupa has written... Um, some very nice poetry on the Chandrayaan three mission, and um, and then um, Chat has done some really good riffs off her Chandrayaan three poetry. But you know, I didn't have time for that. But um, so she's really getting into this. She seems to be much more on the upbeat side about this. Except, you know, she says if chat can start writing really good poetry, then I'll quit. And I hope that was just a fleeting comment. I think it was um, because, um, you know, at, at some, you know, I just wonder what's going to happen to school children, um, you know, when, when they're supposed to write poetry, uh, which, what ninth grader is going to want to write poetry, which is always a kind of scary thing to do. It's kind of like going to your first dance or, um, you know, first time you're up to bat in a, in a little league uh, or, you know, high school baseball game or something like that. And it, you know, it, it can be scary all in itself when chat is so good at writing poetry you know at this point it needs a lot of prompting to do good poetry but um you know it it's yeah it's a scary thing alexis also who decides what's good poetry and what's not um yeah okay so so w one of the things that uh, initial confounded chat about Rupa's prose poem was if you use the, the this is something I inferred. Um, at first, I was referring to it as prose poetry, which, you know, is a category. Um, but it keyed in on the word poetry. And every single, you know, you may have noticed that her Poet, her poem did not have any rhyming at all. And um, Chat insisted on having rhyming. And, uh, you know, I would point out that it was rhyming, but I, I would still call it prose poetry, and it would still rhyme. It's like the word poetry triggered a thought in uh, Chat's mind. 
uh, you can use thought and mind, you know, in quotes, um, that it had to rhyme. And finally, I, I sort of in a semi frustration, I said, OK, chat, uh, let's forget the word phrase prose poetry. Let's just call it prose. And uh, I would like you to write prose in the style of Rupa's uh, family tree. And it did, it tried about uh, four times with, you know, I did different prompting to try to improve it. And it just, it was really hollow. And uh, so her prose could not be mimicked. I, I, I shouldn't say could not, but in my several, you know, couple hours working with it, it did not come up with anything that was useful. It was like crap. It, it was hollow, it was tinny. And, um, you know, uh, a lot of, it was kitschy. And, um, but it was able to understand Rupa's poetry really well. And, uh, you know, I have read that poem about 20 times, I would say. And, um, you know, a dozen times before chat entered the picture. And, uh, you know, I have very much the same comments and thoughts about it. Uh, if I had tried to write it up, it would have taken a, a day to polish it up. Um, and, you know, chat did it in um, about 10 seconds. So I want to ask Alexis, so you think that, or, or maybe Jeff said it, that chat GPT understands human emotions? Does it really understand it or just mimic it? Do we even understand? I mean, do psychologists understand human emotions? Well, I mean, uh, my view is that, first of all, we have to, like, think about what we, you know, uh, assume understanding means okay because understanding for us uh, involves like witnessing like being having awareness you know right and uh, so and then like imagine it to like a prior experience that we've had okay so first we have experiences you know that we've you know we, we can match to or like a uh, process through our awareness our presence right um like the big question is like, does artificial intelligence have the capacity to develop awareness and right. yeah. you know, and then recognize uh, experiences? And that's a really difficult question because you know Jeff and I have talked about this, but one of the problems is that we cannot prove that we are aware. Okay, we can you know it's a subjective experience, you know. And therefore, um, you know, doesn't have any objective validation that you can actually prove, you know? So like in the same way, you cannot like uh, develop a rigorous test, I think, to whether artificial intelligence becomes aware or not. You can, you know, recognize patterns that are identical to somebody who has awareness, but whether it's having a subjective, subjective experience or not, I think will remain beyond, you know, our ability to determine. So that like links to your question about like uh, emotions, you know, and recognizing human emotions. If it doesn't have any type of awareness, then like, you know, it's just like matching data, I guess, you know, but, um, you know, but if it has some degree of awareness, then there's gotta be some recognition and therefore some degree of understanding, you know, that, that's my thinking on this. I mean, uh, take take, take yeah, just yeah, can I hop in real quick? Sorry, I'm oh, I have sure. to go, but I'm gonna make you. I'm gonna stop the recording. And I'm gonna make you the host. Um, okay. So that when you guys are done having your conversation, you can just uh, close it out for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Right. Yeah. Thank.